Normally I'd do an intro here, but I'm far too excited to show you what I've got in my pockets. So let's dive in. Unarguably, in 1998, one of the most recognised and successful and long-lasting games consoles ever made was released, the Game Boy Colour. Now nearly 25 years on, it's back, sort of. This is the Analog Pocket, made by Analog, a company who specialise in remaking old consoles for the modern age. The Analog Pocket is built to replicate the golden era of the Game Boy, natively playing cartridges from the original, colour and advanced versions with no emulation. Hmm. The nostalgia absolutely screams out of this product, but with a few huge twists. The display is a very crisp 615 ppi with a resolution of 1600 by 1440 squeezed into a 3.5 inch panel. This thing is absolutely gorgeous, and if you're worried about scratching it, it uses Gorilla Glass to cover the display. Lastly, a 4300 mAh rechargeable battery powers this beast for around 6 hours of playtime using a control set that will be extremely familiar for both Game Boy and Game Boy Advance users alike. So, why am I so hyped about this? Well, a few years back I started tinkering around with old Game Boys. I first started with this one, playing some of the old games on it, and I absolutely loved the whole nostalgic, physical feel of playing cartridges on a handheld console. And I even modded my own to sort of match my PlayStation controller, which is pretty cool. I loved having to find a cartridge, plug it in, blow in it, and the games are just fantastic. I grew up playing games like Pokemon Red, Super Mario Land, and the Godforsaken Zool, a game so hard that even after 25 years, I still haven't completed the first level. On easy. Now, going back to these games and playing on the Game Boy Color after all these years gave me that massive kick of nostalgia. And it reminded me of a time when games were simpler and less competitive. I don't have to worry about snorting G Fuel or worry about using those flappy paddles on the back of my controllers or even worry about upping the sensitivity to 600% of the default to try and get an advantage. But there are a few problems with this newfound nostalgia. Over the past 20 years, I've grown accustomed to some of the things we take for granted. Nearly two decades of using bright backlit displays beaming light directly into my eyes must have had a negative impact on my eyesight because I don't remember the Game Boy Color ever being this so damn hard to see you literally cannot see a thing on it. How in God's name did I play this nearly in pitch black on night car journeys or under the sheets after my bedtime? I do not know. But the Analog Pockets display is nothing short of fantastic. In fact, it's so fantastic that it has more pixels per inch than an iPhone. In fact, it's got more pixels per inch than anything I've ever come across. Possibly a little bit excessive considering I'll mostly be playing 8-bit on it, but I cannot overstate how amazing this display is, and Analog have really utilised it in some truly magical ways. Firstly, you can view the games in original native resolution to their native system, obviously with it being backlit. Now, when playing original Game Boy games, holding the Analog button and pressing the left and right cycles the available versions of the displays. And that means that you can play with the standard, the pocket, the light, and bizarrely a pinball neon pixel matrix thing, which I don't ever remember being on a Game Boy, but okay. Now, when playing the Game Boy Advance, you get the standard and the SP model. Now, this is cool, but this display has one final option across all game systems. And that's displaying in analog pocket optimized, which is utterly unbelievable. It creates a clean, crisp picture that makes games look so good you would have thought they'd been developed last week, but alone over two decades ago. Now, I'm not even going to pretend to understand exactly how they've done this. In the past, upscaling low pixel games has been done through something called 
integer scaling, which is where it sort of removes blurring that upscaling often causes through grouping pixels together. However, the Pocket is touted at using non-integer scaling, so how on earth they've made it look so fantastic is utter witchcraft. If anyone more knowledgeable about resolution scaling can translate how analog have managed this into layman's terms, please feel free to chime in the comments. I'd be very interested in finding out. But the fact this thing can play cartridge from a host of game systems is incredible with that new resolution or new optimized display. Now, natively, it supports all of the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games, but there are adapters to make it work with other systems. There's one for Game Gear, uh, Neo Geo Pocket, Atari Lynx, and TurboGrafx-16. But the technology that gives Pocket this ability to play all of these game systems is actually rather complicated and something I don't really fully understand as well. It uses something called an FPGA core, and there are two of them inside this. Now, before this review, I'd never even come across what an FPGA core is, so I didn't really understand it at first, and actually, I still don't fully understand it. The science behind the FPGA cores goes way over my head, but to summarise what I think I understand, an FPGA core is basically a post-manufacturer consumable, consumer configurable core. That was a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? But in a nutshell, it basically means that developers have full access to one of the cores, which has been dedicated specifically for their use. What this actually means in real world use, I don't know. Perhaps custom firmware? Custom OS? Anyway, one thing is for certain, playing any game from any system on here has never looked so fantastic. Although a slight criticism here is that the aspect ratio of some of the systems, such as the Game Boy Advance, means that the screen won't fill out entirely because the aspect ratio is that of the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color. But we can't have it all, can we? Actually, there is one other thing, specifically about playing Game Boy Advance games, that I'm not too keen on. And that's the controls. For the most part, the feel and experience is so similar to that of the original Game Boy. And I guess the element of controls is fantastic. But of course, the Game Boy Advance had two shoulder buttons. And the way Analog have implemented this in this form factor is a little bit uncomfortable. They're sort of squeezed in either side of the cartridge. It's playable, but it's certainly not ergonomic. It is a bit reminiscent, actually, of the Nintendo DS, with that similar sort of squared off shoulder buttons. But also on the subject of buttons, the controls on the side of the device are a little bit annoying. There's the volume buttons, also used to control the brightness, and then there's the on-off button. And they're a bit fiddly to press, as they're quite small and sit flush to the exact side of the console, maybe a very, like, less than a millimetre distance. Now, funnily enough, the promo pictures that they have on their website, the 3D renders, show these buttons sticking out a lot more. Now, I've checked other reviews and images of other people's pockets in hand, and it looks like they're all like mine, so fortunately, this one isn't a defective unit. But unfortunately, that means they've decided to change this from the original design, and in my eyes, it makes it a bit more finicky. What would have been better, in my opinion, would have been to keep a similar design here to the Game Boy Color, with a switch simply for the on-off, like this, and then a scroll wheel for the volume. I mean, they've done so much of the original Game Boy design, it wouldn't have been much more to keep that, surely. I don't know if perhaps there's a legal issue around this, but there's even an original link cable port, which is fully functioning. And believe it or not, it allows you to connect devices like this, which is just as useless now as it was back then. The other new additions, however, are a USB-C connection on the bottom uh, next to the link port, new stereo speakers on the top sides because the original Game Boy only had a mono speaker, and a micro SD card slot, which is super, super important. Now, I want to get this out in the open. Officially, the Analog Pocket does not play ROMs. It's been designed to play cartridges without any emulation involved, so you can't just drop a ROM on an SD card and expect to play it. Not something I publicly condone or recommend, of course, simply because of the legal issues surrounding this, but for the sake of knowledge, it would appear that there are ways around this. 
One of those is by using devices such as flash cartridges from EverDrive. There's also whiffs on the wind of being able to port existing ROMs into a readable format on the pocket. Again, none of which I publicly condone, but a simple Google should give you the information that you need on that. So now you understand what the SD card slot is not for, what it is for is infinitely cooler. But some of it has yet to be realized. Now the two functions of this that get me excited first is to offer a way to load and create your own Game Boy games through a piece of software called GB Studio, which is literally a drag and drop creator that makes creating Game Boy games super, super simple. Being able to test your games in a way that's physically identical to the intended platform is awesome. But the second reason the SD card slot gets me excited is because of the planned future of analog pockets. Now coming soon is something that they're calling Analog OS, which will bring a massive host of new features that could be groundbreaking for this form factor. One of the features I'm most excited for with the new OS is the ability to create save states on that SD card slot without having to rely on save states on the cartridges themselves. Now this functionality is super important in the preservation of Game Boy games. Ultimately, with the nature of how cartridges work, there's a battery on the inside of them that's soldered directly onto the board itself. Now, this is what keeps the memory stored on that cartridge, and as we know, batteries don't last forever. Those with the know-how can replace the batteries, and I have done with Pokemon Silver. But having safe states externally means you don't have to go through that rigmarole, and your data is far more secure, and if the cartridge battery runs out, you'd still be able to pick up from where you left off. In its current state, it can actually do something extremely cool. When you're playing a game, if you press the button to turn it off just once, it puts it to sleep. And then when you press it again to wake it up, it resumes exactly where you left off. And that is in its current form without the analog OS save states. Which is awesome. Now, this sounds like incredible functionality and I cannot wait to test it, but unfortunately, analog OS hasn't been available at launch. And there's currently no news on a release date, so I guess I'll take a look at this in a catch-up review later on down the line. There's also a few other things locked behind having to buy extra hardware. The dock for first is a good example. This gives you the ability to connect it to a television and also allows you to pair up either to Bluetooth or 2.4G gamepads. Now, unfortunately, without native Bluetooth on this device, it does mean that you can't pair up Bluetooth headphones which is a bit of a shame. But then I guess with the 3.5 mil audio output, it does make it a bit more reminiscent of the whole experience. But the last bit of hardware, which I haven't tested, is a bunch of MIDI connectors to use this thing, connected up to a Mac, PC, or other audio hardware to use the inbuilt audio workstation called NanoLoop, which, supposedly lets you shape, stretch, and morph sounds. However, I'm about as musically talented as a wailing cat, so it's unlikely that part will ever be used on my device. So, what does all this cost? Well, when I pre-ordered this back in 2020, it cost me $199, which equates to about 150 quid. Now, however, if you were to order one, you'd be looking at $219 due to the increase in component prices as a result of the global supply chain being ruined by the pandemic. But even still, I don't think this is unreasonable. In fact, I think it's actually a bargain. If you bought an original piece of hardware like this, the Game Boy Color, this would cost you around £70 for a good condition one anyway. And then after modifications, like an IPS backlit display for another 40 quid, you're coming in at a minimum of 110 pounds plus the tools and time for modding. So for an extra 50 quid, you can have a hell of a lot more safe states on an SD card, stereo audio, multiple display options, USB charging, internal battery, and the list goes on. But for a piece of iconic tech that mirrors and enhances an era, that many of us, many of us are fond of. I think $219 is brilliant. But there's one big glaring problem. It's all very well me talking about cost, but that relies on you actually getting hold of one. Now it took me over a year to get mine from initial release pre-order, which sold out in just eight minutes. And even that was after several delays. 
Now on their website, it's currently saying that if you choose to order one now, you won't be getting hold of one until 2023. But all I can say is do it. If you have any form of need to feel nostalgic and dust off those old Game Boy cartridges, you will absolutely not be disappointed. I can promise you this. But one thing is very, very clear. And that is that I think I'm only just scratching the surface of what this thing can do. I predominantly bought this thing to play Game Boy games on it, but there's so much more that this thing can do and stuff that's way more advanced than my simple desire of trolloping around in some long grass trying to catch a Pikachu. To the point I don't understand quite what the full capabilities of this machine is. I feel like I'm only just using such a small amount of its potential. With the included music synth software, the upcoming Analog OS, the ability to develop your own games and access to a dedicated section of its brain through the FPGA cores, it makes this device far more than just a Game Boy. It makes it bloody incredible and worth every single penny. Sure, it's not without its little issues like the weird flat buttons on the side and it could have a few bits that were a bit better. So perhaps like a, an OLED display or internal Bluetooth and the ability to play on a TV without having to fork out another $100 on the dock. But in this rare instance, the absolute positives of this device far outshine the little criticism like that. And when using it, all of those thoughts immediately get washed away with the nostalgia, combined with the utter awe and magic that analog have worked with the analog pocket. And you know what? That concludes my thoughts on this device. Utterly incredible. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to hit that thumbs up, that subscribe button and notification bell for more episodes. I will be doing a catch up episode on the analog pocket when I do get my hands on analog OS and perhaps after several more months of usage. So you'll want to be around for when that lands. But other than that, guys, thank you very much for joining and I'll see you back for another episode of Stu's Reviews soon.